Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Vera Wilson from the University of Albany, and welcome to Ed Trends. Today's topic, science research in the classroom. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. I am Rory Glass. I'm the Regional Director for the Master Teacher Program in the Capital Region, and I'm really uh, fortunate today to welcome some of our colleagues from down south of us. Um, Without any further ado, I'm just really thankful that they're here and really excited to hear what they have to say. So I'm going to introduce Steve. He's the one I've been communicating the most with, Steve. Who is joining us as a presenter today. Steve, and thank you for joining us on Ed Trends. Um, and if you would do the pleasures of uh, doing the, do the pleasure of introducing our presenters today, Absolutely. as well as yourself. So I'm Steve Aquaro. Um, I teach at Oyster Bay High School on Long Island. I've been teaching for about 10 years. This is my sixth year in research. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, Ryan Haldenwang. He's from West Islip. Uh, Ian Friedman from Wappingers Central School District. John Halloran from Connectquad School District. And Mary Kroll, who actually works with Ryan at um, West Islip School District. So we are part of the research, uh, STEM research PLT as part of Long Island, uh, mostly because it's you know the hotbed for, for research. So I'm gonna take a second here and pause and just let everybody else kind of introduce themselves. So I'm gonna pass it off to Mary real quick. Hi, I teach uh, science research at West Islip High School. I've been teaching research for about 12 years now, uh, 23 years teaching science overall. I teach biotechnology research and advanced research, which are juniors and seniors. I'll pass it off to Brian. Hi, I'm Brian. I also teach at West Isaac High School. I teach IB biology, chemistry, and biotechnology research. I've been teaching here for 19 years, and this is my first year uh, with research. And I'm going to pass over to Ian. Hey, hi, everyone. I'm Ian Friedman. Uh, I teach physics. Oh, my gosh, my kids just entered. Sorry. Um, I'm going to switch rooms in a second. Uh, I teach physics and science research. Um, this is really just the second year we've been doing science research and we are teamed up with the University of Albany. Um, so uh, there's a lot that I've been learning from these fantastic people here today. Uh, <clears throat> my name is John Halloran. I'm a research teacher at Connecticut High School. Uh, 20 plus years I've been teaching, started out with biology and AP biology, moved over to research about eight years when I brought the program back. Um, and right now I'm a full-time research teacher, so I pretty much do nine, uh, nine through 12. And I guess we go back to Steve. Um, yeah, so uh, next slide, please. So um, we're here to talk about, I guess, STEM research programs, what it might look like, some ideas, for how to start them and some of the things that we've gone through. Um, so I guess to start, just as a real quick aside, science research is kind of unlike any other class that you teach. Um, the curriculum isn't something where you go in with a set curriculum and you kind of have to feed off the kids. So there's certain things that we kind of direct and other things that you know we really just have to bounce off of student ideas. So it makes every year a totally different challenge. Um, John is a fan of using the phrase herding cats. And that is something that I've grown to adopt. I think sometimes it can be like that, um, but it is incredibly rewarding to actually see our students break through. So next slide, please. The first thing uh, um, we wanna point out is just you know share out or write in the chat, what are some of the differences that you see between these two classrooms right here? So if you could just either unmute yourself and share out or just write it in the chat, what are some of the biggest differences between these two? I mean, the, the one with the students, one of them is student-led, one of them is teacher-led. Absolutely. Do you guys see anything else different? One's a private school, one's a public school. <laughs> right. And it's, it's really that. It's the, the hands-on. It's the fact that our students here on the left are watching a teacher demonstration where you can almost expect that the teacher is going to say, okay, watch what happens at this point in time. Whereas one on the right, those students are kind of exploring things on their own. And that's really the difference between what research is. It's hard for like an administrator to come in and see what's going on in our class because every day it's, 
it's going to be a little different. But seeing those students on the right, exploring things for the first time is really what we're about. So next slide, please. One of the earliest challenges that we had as our research PLT was really defining our role. Um, you know, there's a lot of fights sometimes with uh, administrators, parents, and they, they expect us to kind of do things. And it was important for us to really come down with what exactly do we do in this class? Like, what's the point of this class? And this is a list of some of the things that we have come up to. So we need to share ideas and challenge conclusions respectfully as peers. We need to conduct hypothesis-driven research, investigate real-world problems, experiment and collaborate with real-world scientists, nurture a passion for learning through scientific exploration, collect and analyze data, and explain our findings at symposia and through publications. In our class, we teach the students how to ask the right questions, how to come up with possible solutions, how to meet roadblocks, and really how to work together. That collaboration is a really big part of it. So that's where we come in with our, um, you know, outward scientists, meeting up with other people, working with peer review, and also presenting that work to the community later on through symposia. Um, next slide, please. So just to start you off with some like simple stuff that we can do, um, you know, people think of science research and you immediately go to the, the huge problems, landing on Mars, um, curing cancer, stuff like that, but it can start small. So this is a sample experiment where the goal was to determine which household cleaner is most effective at inhibiting bacterial growth. So here we've got a plate. Um, we're able to measure what's called the zone of inhibition here, which is how much area is um, lethal to the bacteria. And you're able to see that pretty clearly. It's a great example for students to um, you know, jump into real hands-on science in kind of a simplistic way. So this experiment isn't difficult to run, it's not overly expensive, and it's something where the students are able to really come up with their own hypothesis and, and really dive into what's going on. So here we have three different cleaners, Lysol, Mr. Clean, and Triclosan. Um, obviously here we have the Triclosan working really well, and over here, not at all. So one more slide, please. This is what that can look like. So this is actually one of Mary's um, research students projects where they've turned it into a paper and really thoroughly presented their results. This is like a perfect example of what we would expect at something at the end of the year. Um, here we investigated those oils, triclosan household products on both fungi and E. coli. And what we were able to find was that, you know, the antibiotics like triclosan really work on bacteria, but it was totally ineffective against something like um, the bread mold, which was the, the other plates. Next slide. So another example of something real simple and easy to run is something with algae. So on the left here, you see three different types of algae being grown and the student in the microscope is looking at that view on the right. This is a, a slide called a hemocytometer, which is kind of common for cell counting. So with this, we're able to test, you know, different water conditions or something. Um, and then we're able to see exactly how many, uh, algae cells would be within this area. So this teaches some simple microscopy skills, some culturing skills, and again, is kind of an easy, straightforward project that we can enter. So next slide, please. And this is what that can look like. It's something at the final end of the year. So this was the effect of different organic fertilizers on the growth of um, a certain type of algae. So what we're able to see here is that over time, obviously the algae count per day should increase, but we're able to see that they're increasing at different rates. So we're able to draw some conclusions about which fertilizers work best. So from those simple experiments, now we'll drive into some of the more complicated stuff of what exactly we're doing here and how we kind of run our program. So as a research teacher, we have to wear a lot of different hats. Um, again, every day is a totally different lesson. Sometimes it's a little chaotic. Um, again, that phrase herding cats, I really <laughs> come to love, um, but it can be really rewarding too. So we have to act as a facilitator with discussions between students where we're not really teaching them something because the thing that they're trying to explore might not actually have an answer. We have to act as a librarian. We have to help them find sources. And sometimes that can be a real challenge. Um, my students were amazed that he had, one of my students spent days trying to find an article and I was able to find it quickly. Um, so that stuff's important. Safety officer, you know, sometimes our students are working with 
potentially dangerous chemicals or you know bacteria. So we have to teach a lot of the, the safety that goes on. Lab assistant, I'm running my autoclave basically every day now to make sure that our plates are good and ready to go. Um, we also have to play things like the devil's advocate. So we need to be, you know, our biggest cheerleaders for our students. They will come into roadblocks. They are going to stumble. Um, part of research is being able to overcome those obstacles. And that I think is one of the biggest things that we have to do is really be that cheerleader in our students' corner to help them get through those parts to really see the, you know, the incredible nature of the work that they're doing and the real nature of it. But sometimes it also means playing devil's advocate, where sometimes they might be gung-ho in a certain direction and we have to say, you know, have you thought about this? Maybe where you're going is either a dead end or it can't be done for, you know, one reason or another. And last but not least, we have to be their editor and coach. Um, to do papers and projects like those two that you just saw takes a lot of work and it's not a skill that students are going to come to you having. So we have to kind of go through those skills. Okay, this is what makes a good paper. This is what makes a good presentation and really teach them how to get through that stuff. As far as editing goes, I think one of the most important skills that I've taught my student is peer editing, where I have them kind of spread their, their papers around. But every time I'll get a, a, you know students who give me papers that have been edited by five or six of their peers, and it's still got you know grammar errors or issues with citations. So we have to play that role as well. Now, there's different goals to, to research programs. So, I think that to start the research program, it's really important to understand what you're looking to get out of it. So um, these are all really good goals. And hopefully the, the program that you designed would be a combination of all three of these. So the first is student experience driven. Give stu students the tools to become independent learners. I think this is probably the most important. Um, I've had students who've gone through my program and come back saying, you know, Oh, it's so great because you taught me how to use micropipettes. And I was able to, you know, share that with my, my classes in college or um, because of you, I was able to learn how to use things like JSTOR and really find research for some of these bigger papers that we're writing. And I think once they're done with this program, one of the biggest things that they should get out of it is they can learn how to learn. So it's not a matter of, you know, oh, I haven't been taught that, but it's a matter of giving them the tools to go teach themselves how to do those things. Now, next up, we've got prestige driven um, awards and accolades from competitions such as ISEF. Some of those are really big scholarships and some of those are really big notoriety for schools. So sometimes, you know, the goal is to try to get students into these programs to try to win um, these competitions and bring those accolades back to school. And last but not least is college preparedness driven. Students can add independent research to resumes, and that is a huge thing. I've had a couple of students who over the past two or three years have said that the deciding factor that their colleges have told them was that they had submitted AP capstone research um, papers with their resumes, where other students had equally impressive resumes, but they had done research and that was the thing that really set them over. So again, I think any good program is gonna have kind of a combination of these. And obviously it would be really great to win awards and stuff, but I think it's important to really focus on the fact that we're trying to teach students how to learn, not just what to learn. So now each of us kind of has a different style of program and we're all kind of trying to navigate it. I think um, in this, Mary and John have the, the most experience. They've got kind of the, the most built up programs, but I think what we're all trying to get to is one of these three to five year plans. As of right now, I've been running my class as a singleton year, where it's a general research class that's focused on one topic from the year. One of the problems I'm starting to run into with that is that my students aren't equipped with certain tools. So like I expect them like, okay, today you're going to go culture your bacteria and they've never done that before. So now um, it's March right now and I've got one student who's still like in the beginning phases of collecting data and some of her work is due within the next month or so. So, you know, having the one year class is a bit tight and you kind of have to condense everything a little bit, which is something I'm kind of learning the hard way. So I think a three or four or even five year program would be ideal where you get the kids in an early year and we'll go over this a little later, but you teach them some basic skills at first, maybe how to read papers and some basic 
you know, culturing techniques, sterile techniques, stuff like that. And then as they get into their third, fourth, and fifth year, you know, sophomore, junior, senior, they've got all those skills built up. They already know what direction they want to take their project with. And then they have like their full junior year, let's say, to really like hone a nice project. And then by senior year, they've got their data from last year. And maybe it's just rerunning a couple of trials to explore it a little further and putting some polishing touches on it. In addition to that, there is AP Capstone. So AP Capstone consists of two different classes, AP Seminar and AP Research. The way my school is running it, AP Seminar is actually an English class that students take in 10th grade, but AP Research is a class that they can take in 11th or 12th. If they get both AP Seminar and AP Research, they qualify for what's called a Capstone Diploma, which is just another feather in their cap. In addition to that, some programs run with um, research only completed institutions. I've met with some teachers who their entire job is really to prep students for competitions and things because most of their actual research is done outside of the school in you know, accredited research institutions, whether those are Stony Brook, Brookhaven National Lab or something like that. And then last but not least, we have things like the Albany program, which is a three-year program for some college credits. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ian for getting started. Hi everyone. Um, so as someone who is relatively new to science research, this is my second year, um, I thought it would be important to talk about how to get started because uh, it sounds like a fantastic thing obviously to jump into a science research program, but um, the question is like, what steps do you need to take in order to, to build a program um, or to you know, like join a program um, and what you need to kind of figure out so I think the first thing that you need to think about or the first couple things you need to think about are number one, how long will the program last? As Steve said, you know, three to five years is typical, but there are some research programs that do it for one year. Um, I will say uh, there are some huge, huge benefits to grouping cohorts together, meaning, you know, if you have 10th graders, 11th graders and 12th graders all in the same class together, you'll find that the upperclassmen really step into leadership roles to help the underclassmen. Um, and it also makes it easier on you as a teacher because um, there's less of a burden kind of placed on you. Science research is not about, teaching science research is not about the teacher knowing everything. It's really not. It's about the students figuring out things on their own and you being there to support and guide them to the best of their abil your ability and their abilities. Um, so don't think that you need to know everything in order to teach science research. Uh, you might want to think about whether you want to do this independently or partner with a university. Uh, our program in Wappingers is partnered with uh, University of Albany's uh, University in a High School program, their science research program, which has a number of high schools uh, that are associated with it and students can earn college credit. Um, so it really gets them prepared to jump into college with extra credits but it has a lot of other benefits to it as well um, and is partnered with certain competitions. Uh, getting the program approved obviously by a district is important because uh, it can cost some money to finance and it does take resources away if teachers need to teach it. But I would say there are a ton of selling points. Um, it is just so empowering to students to be able to do a program like this. And it's not just about learning science research techniques. Students really develop like leadership skills, they develop presentation skills, they develop confidence to go out and communicate with professionals. There's just so many selling points to a program like this that I think a lot of districts can be convinced if you can convince them that it's worth putting the resources in to do it. So um, you just need to kind of find, and I know that our district, for example, we just decided to start with a very low budget and hope that it grows over time. And that's kind of what I've heard from a lot of people is that it will grow. Um, and the other challenge is finding teachers who are willing to teach it. Um, and some people are kind of intimidated because um, they feel like they need to know everything about every science field. And that's really not true at all. Uh, and beyond that, you just need to get students involved. And I think once you get some students, it starts to spread word of mouth. Don't think you just have to limit yourself to honor students though. Uh, there's a lot of kids that are really interested in a particular area of interest. You could have a kid that, you know, loves music, but is bored by traditional science classes and doesn't do well in them and might really excel in your program and get a ton out of it. Um, and beyond that, 
you need to start looking for like areas to help students find mentors, uh, labs in the area, internships that they can do stuff like that. So there is, you know, a lot of different steps you might want to take to help people get started. Um, but with that, if you do it, it's fantastic. So I'm going to actually kick it off to Mary at this point. Thank you. Next slide, please. So um, the timeline for a research class is pretty important because you need enough time for the kids to come up with their ideas, to develop their plan, to analyze it and make sure it's safe for them to conduct, to, for you to get the supplies in for them. And they really need a good amount of time to analyze their data. So focusing on data collection um, is key. We try to give them a solid three, four months if possible. And you might think that that's a long time, but it goes very quickly. And even in the first few weeks, just kind of nailing down their protocol and how they're gonna collect their data, it really does take some time. And then giving them that time in the spring to analyze the results, figure out what it all means. And the most important part, share what they found. So this we found is a pretty nice timeline um, for a research class. Next slide, please. So we wanted to give you an example of what a, like a robust program might look like if you have the time to expand to like a four or five year uh, research pro program. Introducing the kids in eighth grade is a great way to start um, their experience in research. In our school, we do an every other day uh, class for eighth graders and they just do modules. They'll do a few weeks in a biology experiment. They'll do a few weeks in a chemistry experiment. Usually they're shown something and then they each pick a variable that they want to test and they're starting to really get a handle on the scientific method this way. Um, and then in high schools, we have a skills and science research class. They meet every day for one period. It's an additional science elective. And they really develop their skills here, how to design a project, how to collect data, how to analyze data, and how to communicate what they found. We have um, what could be a standalone class, and Brian's actually going to talk to you about that in a little bit, um, biotechnology research in 10th grade, where they continue to work on skills, but they're more focused, um, in this case, in biotechnology. And then, as Ian said before, having juniors and seniors together, or sometimes even sophomores, juniors, and seniors together in the same class is a great model for the kids to learn from each other, uh, for the seniors to be leaders, and to really show by example what it means to be in a lab. And it's great for the juniors to also challenge the seniors with uh, new ideas and ask them questions. So this is a nice example of a, a five-year program. Next slide, please. One of the hardest parts in research is coming up with ideas. It's, you know, thinking back to when you were a kid and you had to do a science fair project and you had no idea what to do. Um, I get calls from my sisters all the time. Gabriella has to do science fair project, what do I do? Juliana has to do science fair project, what do I do? So it, it really is a big challenge. Um, and the key is you wanna help the kids come up with something that is their own idea, so they have ownership, but is also something that they really are interested and in, want to do. So a good way to do this is to have them start reading through some popular science uh, magazines or websites to see what kinds of things are out there or what they might be interested in. Doing some kind of a, a deep dive in literature to read about what's happening now, something in the last two, three years, what's going on in the world that they can maybe investigate. Science News for Students is an awesome resource. Um, and they have a yearly subscription to a magazine that comes every two weeks with great articles written in language that most high schoolers can understand. Um, and at our school, we do getting to know you presentations. One of the first things we do with the kids when they walk in the door, they have to create a slide and it can only be one slide with nothing but photos on it. And then they have to share with the class information about them. And often that's how they come up with the idea for their project because they you can clearly see when they're passionate about something that they're doing or that they're interested in. And that's a great avenue to come up with a, a research project idea. Next slide, please. So evaluating the kids' work is very different than most traditional classes. There are no tests. Research is not a test-based course, it's performance-based. So the kids do literature reviews. Um, they have to find a scientific journal article, they have to read it, they have to write a summary of it. Um, and they ultimately will use that as background information to create their experiment, to write their research plan. 
And then as part of their research plan, they have to do the safety analysis. Then they are in the lab ex uh, experimenting, collecting their data. Then they're analyzing their data and finally communicating the results. All of this comes with grades. They're all based on rubrics though, rather than tests. It would be impossible to create tests because they would be individualized for each kid. And while content is important, a lot of content is at their fingertips. They all have computers in their hands, whether it's a phone or a Chromebook. Um, they can all look up information, but the skills, learning how to do these things, these 21st century skills are just as important as the content. In fact, I got an email recently from a graduate, from an alumni who said, um, I'm graduating in just a few weeks. I just got accepted into a pre-PhD program for biomedical engineering. And while the science that I learned with you was great, the best thing that helped me was learning how to do literature reviews, learning how to write in a scientific language um, and being able to openly express the results that I found and communicate with other people. So those skills are just as important and, and our kids get those skills um, pretty much every day. They're working on those skills and research. Next slide, please. So there's lots of different competitions that students can attend. As Steve said, that's only a part of what we do. Uh, it's a fun part for the kids. They love going to competition. They love field trips. They love um, sharing what they've done. And, and competitions are great, but you have to be careful to have a nice balance because it can't all be about competition. On Long Island, our kids often participate in Long Island Science Congress, which is more of a local fair. That's a great fair for kids who are doing experiments in their high school labs. And then there's Long Island Science and Engineering Fair or the New York State Science and Engineering Fair. Those are great for kids who maybe are working at a research institution or maybe they're working with a mentor. And those can feed into larger fairs like the Regeneron ISEF Fair. Um, so competitions are great and there's a lot of opportunities out there, um, but just be careful that it's not the sole focus of your course. Next slide, please. So I'm sure you're excited and completely overwhelmed at the same time at this point. There's a lot of information. Research is amazing um, and it's incredibly rewarding to teach, but it can be very overwhelming. So we have some pretty quick and easy, inexpensive ways to get started. Next slide. So as Steve said, microbiology is a great way to get started. Um, bacteria grow overnight. So if something happens and it fails, you just start again the next day. That's really helpful. Uh, with that in mind, you do have to be careful because there are certain bacteria that you want to work with in the lab, like E. coli K12. It's specifically engineered to be safe for high school students, um, but you certainly don't want them to be working with something pathogenic. So if you stick with the E. coli or something similar, you can teach the kids sterile technique, how to subculture bacteria, how to keep them alive. For some of these kids, just keeping a living thing alive is a great uh, lesson to learn. Um, and then how to spread the bacteria on plates, how to quantitatively measure um, with the Kirby Bauer method. Next slide. And the equipment to do this is pretty cheap and um, easy to get. We often use Carolina Biological. Um, there are links here to all of these different materials. I'm not sure if, if the slideshow is gonna be shared. If it is, um, you can easily link to these. If not, they're pretty easy to find on Carolina or other sites. Um, but Carolina Biological we found has been great for shipping live specimens. And if anything comes dead, they ship you a new one right away. Next slide, please. Algae, very similar idea to um, bacteria and that they grow fairly quickly and you can visibly see results fairly quickly, which is great for the kids so that they uh, can see changes happening. It also needs to be measurable. So algae is awesome because you can count it. You can use a hemocytometer normally for counting blood cells, but it works just as well as a cheap way to count algae cells. Uh, the kids can learn how to do microscopy and imaging, which is really important in research. And next slide has, again, all of the supplies that you might need um, to grow any algae in your classrooms. And I'm going to pass it back to Steve, who's going to talk about some sociology and psychology projects. So some of the stuff that we've seen up to this point requires a little bit of background knowledge on the teacher's part. Um, you have to know how to do that sort of stuff, right? You have to know how to be sterile, how to um, culture that bacteria yourself so you can teach it, but also sometimes the materials. So when I first started my program, I didn't have much in the way of materials. 
and we were very slowly building it for the first couple of years. So I found myself kind of pushing students into the sociology and psychology side of things because it's as simple as writing a survey. Um, so some things that you need for sociology or psychology type projects, which seem to be more accessible for some students, are things like survey tools. Um, I've used SurveyMonkey, Google Forms in the past, things like that. There's also some other um, broader things you can use, like content analysis. I saw one really cool project that was on um, themes of boredom over time. And what the student did was looked for um, phrases in old like diary entries from like the Civil War and then um, through kind of personal writings forward using one of the softwares are available at our library. And they did this coding where they were able to um, kind of create this, this network of words that are synonyms, almost like a thesaurus, and then mark how many times do these words come up to try to get a result. You're also able to do some things like behavioral monitoring. Um, that could be something as simple as going and watching people at the mall, asking them you know, why they do certain thing or just logging how many people walk into a certain store or something like that. And then the last would be uh, GSR, which is um, kind of a simplified stress response. Now, while these do seem easy, it's kind of the low hanging fruit, you do have to be aware of some pitfalls. Um, so for example, you need to get letters of consent for everybody that you study. Everything needs to be anonymized, meaning that you can't just say, oh, this is subject one and he answered this because that data might contain clues as to who subject one was. So you have to be very careful about that. You have to do what's called an IRB or institutional review board to make sure that the questions aren't going to cause any undue stress or harm on people. I had one student do something with um, like fatherless, you know, fatherless upbringing and how that might impact. So some of those questions are a little dicey for high school students, you know, drug and alcohol use, stuff like that. So it does need to be cleared by the school. You need to make sure you're doing ethical research. And then last, you need to have a crisis response. So for students doing something that might, you know, strike a nerve, you need to make sure that that student is also giving out resources for those students who might be struggling. So while it does seem to be kind of the low hanging fruit, it can be a little bit more of a headache in certain ways in terms of paperwork and things like that. Next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite areas, it's um, ecological and environmental skills. So we can use a lot of really cool techniques like transects and quadrats. That's this upper picture on the right here. Um, where you count a certain number of organisms in an area, you GPS tag that area, and then you draw a line 100 meters in a compass direction. You know, you pick the direction 138 degrees or whatever. And then every, let's say 20 meters, you stop and drop that quadrat, which is a one meter by one meter square, and then count up the organisms. And from that, you can estimate quite a bit. Um, you can also do behavioral monitoring on the organisms that you see, whether in the wild or captive in a like class pet type environment. Um, we do a lot of soil and water analysis with this and then maps and QGIS is something that I'm exploring more. This software is incredibly powerful and robust. It can be a little bit complicated to use, but in the right hands, it can do some really cool stuff. Next slide, please. So this is one of um, the coolest projects I had using this kind of ecological study. So it was the effect of sound pollution caused by vessel traffic on the activity of a snail. Um, the student went out with quadrats and monitored snail activity, and then we actually recorded the sound of a ferry and played it back to the snails to try to figure out what exactly is changing with um, these, you know, with their behavior. Next slide, please. This is another one that I had some students do. This was actually a ninth grade project, the effects of ecological light pollution on mealworms. Um, they had set up these individual tanks, you can kind of see in this picture, and then they had them with different... Um, light intensities and for different periods of time to simulate like, you know, traffic lights being on all the time or street lights or something like that. And then uh, monitored the behavior and growth of mealworms. Next slide, please. So this is some equipment that you might need for ecology. The good thing is, is that some of this stuff is actually fairly cheap. So you can do soil analysis with a lot of kits from like Lamotte's or Carolina, and that stuff is usually pretty cheap. Um, this square thing here is one of those quadrats. It's actually set up into 10th of a meter. The tool on the top left is something that I am trying to buy for this coming year. It's um, colorimeter, but it comes with all sorts of different test kits. So you just tell it what test kit you are um, testing for, let's say lead, and then you do whatever that lead protocol is. And then when you put that 
mixture, which will be a certain color into this device, it'll, it'll tell you exactly how much concentration is there. Um, and then last but not least, I use a lot of GPS tags. So I actually use GPS, uh, no, USGS topo maps. Um, they're topographic maps that you can get for any area around the world. And then I have the students take that information, plug it into something like QGIS or ArcGIS to be able to do um, some cool research. It helps to have an area around your school to do this. So for me, I have the Long Island Sound because Oyster Bay is right on the, the sound there. But other schools might have different things. So I'm actually going to take this time to pass it along to Brian for a cool opportunity that they have at their school. Okay, so uh, piggybacking off of what Steve had mentioned, the ecological testing uh, is really great to do in research. It gets the students out into the environment. And we just happen to have at West Isaac a really great opportunity where we have behind our running behind our school, uh, we have a creek and that creek is, is really, really polluted. Uh, so the DEC came in two years ago and remediated this entire area. Like this is a super fun site, which I know doesn't sound like the best thing to have in the back of your school, but when they came in and remediated, we partnered with them and turned the area into a classroom. So like now we take our research students out into the creek all the time uh, to monitor, to monitor the, the water, to clean up all the time. And we do a lot of our experimentation for our biotechnology program, which I'm gonna take a look at next. So next slide, please. Okay, so here at West Islip, we do have that five-year program. And then in the 10th grade year, we have students take a biotechnology research. So you can kind of take a look at their timeline here. So we're September, October. They're taking a look at what they want to research, like types of organisms they want to research. We show them some uh, collection techniques out in the environment. November, we do a little bit of a research plan. And then from December to January, February, we have them start doing DNA extractions. Uh, eventually with the goal of doing DNA barcoding, they're learning uh, PCR, gel electrophoresis, creating solutions for all of those things, micropipetting. So they're gaining those skills in biotechnology as they're working through their project. Uh, so right now we're in the March phase where we're teaching them bioinformatics and data analysis with again, the end goal of, of presenting their results uh, in May or June. So next slide, please. All right, so here you can see some of our students in the fall out in Willits Creek, like it's been a lot cleaner now. Uh, they were out in waders. You can see them doing quadrat sampling. So they're gathering as many species of whatever their focus is. So if they were focusing on animals, uh, insects, they were gathering them. Some of them were focusing on plants. Uh, some of them were pulling stuff right out of the creek. Uh, so again, if you have access to an area like that at your school, this is a great way to incorporate that into your research program. So next slide, please. Here are some ideas of the projects that we have going on this year. A lot of them are biodiversity based. Uh, so we have students looking at specifically the types of spiders they caught, uh, lichens, mushrooms, lots and lots of insects. We have some students comparing diversity behind the school to diversity in, in local environments, um, but all with this goal of learning how to do biotechnology and barcoding. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the tools that you would need for a biotechnology program. So yeah, we understand that some of these are really expensive. So like this level type of course would cost more than say like a, an intro to research course, but there are a ton of grants out there. We happen to get all of our equipment through a focused grant here at West Islip. So the initial input to buy all the equipment didn't cost us anything. The upkeep is a little bit expensive, but if you can grab one of those, one of those uh, grants and get the money, this is a great direction to go in. Uh, next slide, please. And then here we have some of our students working, right? So we're teaching them how to properly use all of that equipment. I mean, it looks like a real full-on science lab. Um, it's intense every single day, but they're learning a heck of a lot about biotechnology here. And with that, I am going to, oh, oh, here's, oh, here's one of our, one of our research projects. I think it's from two years ago, Mary, three years ago, maybe, where students yes. were collecting uh, mosquitoes out in the, in the swamps and doing barcoding, creating cladograms, looking at evolutionary trees, and just checking to see how many different types of species we had out here uh, on Long Island. 
All right, so with that, I'm going to flip over to John. Hi. Um, so one of the most important things, I guess, in the beginning of a research program and throughout your research career uh, is reaching out uh, for expert help or just people who have experience in research or have been teaching research. Um, the key is to make it a personal connection. Uh, probably some of your best sources are your local universities. So down on the island, we use uh, SUNY Stony Brook or Farmingdale um, or Delphi Hostra. Um, but there's of course lots of um, universities and colleges upstate or Western New York, sorry, didn't mean to offend anybody. Um, also another spot is government laboratories and agencies. I'm going to talk a little bit more about a, a particular program that we're involved in here called SPARC, and that's through uh, Brookhaven National Lab. Um, you can also reach out to the DEC. Um, the parks run a lot of great programs. You have a lot of people there who um, just love to have kids go to the parks. There's actually, I believe New York State has a, a grant program that they'll actually pay um, for your visit and all the necessary busing and things like that. Um, if you have any research institutions, um, SeaWorld's a little bit of a trip for us, but um, we do have a small aquarium out here uh, and they've been great um, doing some, you know, some research involving uh, the supplies they have, um, either the fish or the shrimp or uh, what have you. Uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension has a lot of programs and they're located throughout the state um, and they're very, um, very willing to help. And then, then there's just your local experts. Um, we had a group of kids who was looking to do, uh, they, they got into ticks. Um, they have a lot of tick-borne illnesses here on Long Island. Um, and it was kind of a red flag as far as I wasn't gonna have kids go out and collect ticks. Um, that's one of those safety officer things you have to do. Um, so we, you know, we, we looked around and we found that we have a Suffolk County vector department here that's in charge and they were more than willing to supply us with ticks that they were already collecting. And then next thing you know, they were like, hey, what about mosquitoes? You want this, you want that. Um, so you'd be amazed at how much um, help you can get when you find these local uh, experts. And then uh, when the kids get older, um, junior, senior year, um, and they're doing a lot more in-depth research and doing a lot of literature reviews, uh, encourage them to reach out to the scientists. Um, most of your research articles have contact information. Um, have the students email them to ask about their research or just even to thank them about their research. Uh, and sometimes that can strike up a conversation or, um, or a relationship. And then before you know it, maybe you can get a mentorship out of that or even just some advice or even samples I've had students reach out and they were just like, oh, I was interested in this. And I'm, you know, I've been studying with telegans and they were like, oh, we could send you plasmids. We can send you uh, strains, you know, no problem. Uh, and they were really, really helpful with that. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so again, these are some of the research institutes we here, have here on Long Island, uh, Brookhaven National Lab. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our SPARC program that we started. Uh, some of the research teachers here on the island. Uh, Cold Spring Harbor runs a great program called Barcode Long Island. Um, Stony Brook University um, has a summer program, which is something that if um, we've mentioned before, some students go to uh, outside universities to do a lot of their research. Um, and we also, I think Cornell has a program too. Um, if you're in Nassau County, uh, Feinstein Institute also has a summer program. Uh, so a lot of these summer programs are great for kids who um, kind of take research to that next level. Um, they're not for the faint of heart by any stretch of the imagination. Um, most of these summer programs, six to eight week commitments, five days a week, 40 hour weeks. Um, but those are the types of programs where a kid can devote that kind of time and effort and get access to the equipment necessary to, to do a LICEF type uh, or ISEF type project. Uh, next slide. Uh, so SPARC, uh, it stands for Student Partnerships, Student Partnerships for Advanced Research and Knowledge. Uh, it was a program that uh, grew out of a couple of different workshops that Brookhaven was uh, running. Um, kind of new program that was running out of their, uh, at the time, brand new synchrotron called the NSLS2. Um, and what it enabled kids is it enabled students to get access to probably the brightest synchrotron on the planet currently um, and some really high end equipment. Um, and what the program is about is trying to get students to do some high end research um, in an environment that there's lots of support from scientists, there's lots of equipment support. Um, and they're coming up with some pretty uh, amazing projects. So there's basically, you can go to the next slide, sorry. Oh, back one, sorry. So there's basically two different SPARC programs. Uh, we actually have what's called, um, they call them BAGs. They stand for Block Allocation Grants. Uh, and there's two groups currently working there. Mary's the PI at the spectroscopy or the co-PI, I believe. Uh, and I'm also a co-PI for the, the protein crystallography one. Uh, spectroscopy, 
is basically what they're doing is they're uh, using these really intense X-ray beams and these really, um, for lack of a better word, fancy detectors to basically examine materials. Um, and spectroscopy is pretty wide open uh, as far as what you bring. Um, you'll work with the scientists once you get your project idea and they'll try to tell you, they'll kind of steer you in the right direction because there's lots of different beams that have lots of different types of equipment for different samples. Um, but what the students do is they propose a project, it goes through a review process, um, and then they bring their samples uh, to, to BNL and um, they collect data on these samples. Um, and what basically going on is, if I can simplify it quick enough, um, is you're using x-rays to determine what type of elements your sample has. Um, not only what type of elements, where they're located, at sometimes nanometer scales, uh, the abundance of the elements, uh, and in some cases, depending on the, uh, the equipment you're using, even the species, you know, is it a nitrate or a nitrite? Um, so it's some, some pretty high-end stuff. It does take uh, the learning curve is a little steep, but uh, once the kids are invested, uh, they usually meet that learning curve pretty well. Uh, the other one that I'm kind of more familiar with, and if you have any questions on spectroscopy, Mary is the co-PI, so she has lots of experience there. Um, but I'm involved in the protein crystallography. That's the next slide. Um, so protein crystallography uh, it falls under the category of structural biology. And basically what we do there is we use the x-rays, but we're focused only on proteins. Um, so the kids do some background research and try to find a protein of interest. Uh, we usually currently are, are uh, sending to a company called, or an organization called Seattle Genomics, um, and they provide free of charge. You just pay for the shipping, uh, the proteins if they have it. Um, and most of our kids are looking at either bacterial or um, viral proteins. So what they do is they do the research about their protein, they pick a protein, and then they begin the process of trying to crystallize the protein. So they have some wet labs that are involved in setting up trays and learning how to add different chemicals or use different kits to try to get the proteins to crystallize, um, which is not an easy task by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but sometimes, depending on the protein, we actually get um, to use the more sensitive, more expensive equipment, more sensitive equipment um, at BNL, um, and then they get to set up trays on like nanoliter scales. Um, these are just a couple of pictures of some of the crystals that we've had in the past. Some are nice and pretty. Uh, the one in the middle is just a, it's a hot mess of hair-like crystals that were impossible to diffract. Uh, and some of them are extremely, extremely small, uh, but we're lucky because, uh, like I mentioned before, FMX is probably the premier uh, beamline in the country right now. Um, and that's kind of one of the most amazing things about the SPARC program is that the students are using a, a beamline that's um, you know the best in the country, if not the world. Um, so they're able to do some pretty, some pretty heavy science. Okay, next slide. Um, this is just a couple of pictures of what a typical collection would be like. Um, so you have a group of scientists, a uh, group of teachers, sorry, uh, one or two scientists and some students, and they're uh, actually running the beam. They give us quick training, and then it, they, we're off and running, and the kids are really, literally driving the machine. Uh, they're controlling the robots. Uh, they're loading the samples. And then on the picture on the right, um, when everything goes well, we get nice diffraction patterns. Um, currently, we're actually um, we're kind of closed out of BNL because of COVID, uh, but that doesn't mean we actually stopped working. Uh, even uh, just Monday, well, it's, it's only two days ago, uh, we were actually working at night, basically controlling the the beamline remotely. So we're be, you know connecting through the internet, uh, and we were still loading samples and collecting data that way. Uh, but we're hoping to return this summer. Okay, the next picture. And then at the end, basically, um, with protein crystallography, what you're doing is you're getting um, X-ray diffraction patterns and you're using computers, uh, programs like CUT, CCP4, to turn that uh, diffraction data into basically a protein model. Um, and in the past three years that we've been doing it, four years, we've been doing protein crystallography. We've actually had um, several models published to the protein data bank. Uh, I think we have three more coming up, um, hopefully for review right now. Um, and currently, we actually have two papers that are uh, in the peer review process. Oh, Mary, I forgot to mention, Mary actually had a paper published in the spectroscopy group as well. Uh, another cool program, uh, Barcode Long Island, it's in uh, year six, uh, and it was a federal grant that Cold Spring Harbor got to start the program. And basically, it does a lot of what um, Ian was talking about, uh, the biotechnology of basically finding, uh, finding organisms, collecting organisms, um, and then sequencing their DNA to identify the species based on uh, their DNA sequence. 
Um, the nice thing about Barcode Long Island is they have a year-end symposium uh, where the kids get to present their work with, uh, you know, hundreds sometimes of teams that have also done similar work uh, in a very friendly kind of laid-back environment. Um, and probably one of the biggest thrills from one of, some of my students a couple of years ago was to actually meet James, uh, James Watson. So that was kind of a big kick. Uh, Barcode Long Island, unfortunately, the grant run at, ran out, but Cold Spring Harbor is still offering the program. Uh, it's just they're charging a small free, fee to be involved to kind of cover this cost of uh, all the materials and the supplies. Okay, next slide. Um, in the beginning, I mean, when I first started research, like Steve, I had a very limited budget. So it, it was all about trying to find programs that could offer me supplies, resources for free or nothing or very limited price. Um, so one of the things I stumbled on was Astrometrica. I, I'm a biology guy. I had zero knowledge about astronomy, but I was getting ninth graders coming out of earth science. So I figured we'd start there. Um, so Astrometrica is a, a, a quick and easy program. It takes about a month uh, where they actually get data from um, a telescope that's located in Hawaii called Pan Stars. And the kids actually learn to use a program called Astrometrica. It takes about a day or two to teach them uh, and get them up and running. And then what they do is they get different data sets throughout the course of the month and they're using those data sets to try to find um, near earth objects or asteroids basically um, and occasionally they'll find one that's never been found before um, and which is kind of a neat experience because then it becomes a preliminary asteroid and um, I haven't had it happen yet but hopefully after a few years you could follow up if they track the whole orbit then they'd be actually get uh, they'd actually be able to uh, name the asteroid uh, next slide um, other programs that are definitely um, worthwhile to explore, um, Cornell runs a program called the Fish Tracker. Um, it's a great introductory experience into eDNA. So eDNA, um, the E stands for environmental. And what the kids are tasked with is going out and sampling uh, a body of water in their, um, in their district or their community. Um, they're just doing basically the filtering um, and learning how to uh, properly filter the water and then the, the results are actually sent, or I should say the filter paper is then sent to Cornell and they do the qPCR analysis. Uh, and what they're looking for is invasive species or native species that might be rare. Uh, but it definitely gets the kids learning about um, tracking organisms, um, lots of GP, uh, GPS maps and things like that. All right, that's fish tracker. And again, that was that's totally free. They ship everything to you. Um, you don't even pay for shipping. Um, you basically just pack it up when you're done and ship it right back to them. Uh, the asset program, another program out through Cornell, if you Google Cornell and asset, uh, advancing secondary science education through Tetra Hymena. It's another NIH supported program uh, through uh, an organization called SIPA. And uh, what they do is they have a bunch of science modules and they're kind of preset labs with uh, that cover a range of topics from uh, chemiotaxis to phagocytosis to um, pollution. Uh, they just recently introduced a new one on vaping. And um, basically the kids learn how to use this single celled organism called the tetraimena to conduct, conduct a lab experiment. Um, and then they're usually at the end, very open-ended. So it's usually you learn how to do a technique or you learn a little bit about some preset chemicals if you're doing pollution or phagocytosis. And then it's up to the kids to kind of come up with their own independent variables and modify that. Um, one of the things I like about it is it lends itself to um, image analysis. So it's one of the ways I start to teach kids about basically um, collecting data using uh, using microscopes and images, and then analyzing that data, data so you get uh, actual you know hard measurements that they can do a statistical analysis on. And I think this is back to Steve. Yeah. So here's some student testimonials, um, just showing how much research has really helped them over the years. Um, I try to keep in touch with all of my students. Every year we run a science symposium at the end of the year. And I try to reach out to those students who've graduated from the program and are continuing on in science or medicine to um, come back and speak as a keynote speaker at our symposium to show kind of, you know, what their research is going on now and how what they learned in our class really helps. Um, and last slide. So these, this is all of our um, contact information. I know that I personally get a little bit of imposter syndrome standing next to, you know, all these people, Mary and John are exceptionally good at what they do. And some of the stuff that they do is, is really like mind blowing. Um, so it's, we totally understand being like intimidated and overwhelmed by starting a program like this, but with the right resources, um, it's a really 
important and valuable program. So if you have any questions on anything, please reach out, contact us, and we're all more than willing to help when we can. Thank you all. That was that was incredible. What a what an incredible world tour that was too. Just getting so much information. Um, uh, I want to thank you all again for being here. Um, if you uh, any of you in attendance might have noticed in the chat that there's a feedback link there um, that has been placed into the chat. And if anybody has any questions, we're happy to entertain them here. Uh, I have a question. So what do these classes count as? Elective science classes towards graduation? That's a good point. Um, so one thing that I've noticed from my kids, and I'm sure it's probably universal, is at first we didn't weight it. And we had a lot of our highest achievers not taking it because it wasn't weighted and it would hold them back from being valedictorian, salutatorian. So we started actually weighting our research class as um, an honors level class, but it is still technically an elective. Uh, I will tell you in our district, uh, similarly, we do weight it as a honors level class um, for upperclassmen, for juniors and seniors. Um, it is considered a science course, but we also tell students that it's not an excuse not to take other science courses. They really should be taking their core science courses as well. Agreed. I have a question about the IRB. Yeah. How, I, we're a high school and I know that we don't have any type of IRB set up for our district. Do you partner with a local university for that or how, how do you go about that? I actually had to start it. Um, so some of the competitions, LICEF and NICEF and stuff like that will have their own internal IRB and they've got a lot of good resources. But in my school, what I did, I went to the ICEF website and looked up their requirements for what it takes to have an IRB. And I basically modeled our entire IRB off of that, thinking that if we can get through their competitions, then we're probably good. So what I've used, um, we use our school psychologist as um, you know, kind of the, the certified professional in that field. And then I think we have two administrators and our librarian and another teacher. And really the, um, I think you only need administrators and the librarian, uh, or no, administrators and the psychologist, excuse me. And with those two credentials, it would, it would qualify. So we use that. Um, there's a lot of forms that they have to fill out. And again, all of those forms I, I kind of hijacked from ICEF and LICEF and all those other competitions. Well, I can uh, see, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, just to, like, just double check because a lot of schools that are starting AP capstone, the, the students are doing a lot of survey type research. So a lot of pr schools had to start an IRB if they're going to do AP research and seminar. Thank you. If, if you post a, an email address, I, can, I just went through the IRB process for the first time of creating one. And it takes some reading, but it's not as terrible as you'd think. Um, and a lot of student researchers, a lot of student research doesn't need an IRB. A lot of projects don't need that. Um, but if you post an email address, I can send you links to some of the documents I put together for my students. And that's actually something um, Ian just mentioned a really important part. Basically, I go through the IRB and I tell them what's limited and what's not. So we don't work on anything. If we're working on minors, it's always got to be like, that's the only kind of constraint is that they're minors. You're not asking anything about anything illegal or stuff like that. So if you read through the paperwork of, of what needs the IRB, you can kind of sway students around a lot of um, a lot of that stuff. So they don't actually need it. And it's more of just an experience for them to um, learn from than, you know, an actual stressful thing that I hope they pass. I was just thinking also for use of living organisms, that there'd be some sort of an IRB so requirement. Living organisms, Mary's kind of the, the queen of this, um, but it wouldn't be an IRB. It would be either an SRC or an IACUC. So depending on what they're doing, um, there are certain organisms that are considered fine, though. They are invertebrates and E. coli. Oh, okay. Thanks. I don't know anyone who really does research with vertebrate animals because of 
the sort of paperwork going through it, unless you're going to a lab where they already have that in place and they'll often have their own um, IACUC. Right. Um, I do have one student this year who's working with frogs and frog vision, but it's because that he's doing a behavioral, totally non-invasive thing. Basically, he's shutting out the lights and then monitoring frog reactions. So it's not considered harmful to the animals. But if you were doing anything with vertebrate animal tissues, it is a boatload of paperwork. <laughs> you need to have Sometimes you can get that. tissue samples without that, though. So it depends how you get them. That's true, too. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're doing something with fish, for example, and one of the fish dies because they're goldfish and you got them for 25 cents, you would technically need to have a vet do an autopsy on that goldfish to make sure that you didn't do anything personally <laughs> to, to harm it. So most of the time we just try to tell kids, no, that's no go. It's so not worth it. Not worth it. <laughs> Fruit flies. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I want to thank you all again for joining us today. Um, you know, looking at the time here, um, that was an incredible presentation. Um, you put your contact information in there. Um, and I hope you don't mind, because I'm sure people will be reaching out to you and going, hey, you said something and that was really important. So um, thank you. Thank you all for joining us uh, for this session. It was great, um, great stimulating conversations, great hearing your questions. Um, and I thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. And I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Wonderful presentation. Enjoyed it immensely. Thank you.